I said amen and amen. amen. All right, wake up. Don't be dead. The dead praise not the Lord. Don't give yourself away today. It's good to see you. Praise the Lord. We're in our series on, uh, on Gideon from coward to courageous. And last week, in looking at the beginning of this story in Judges 6, we start seeing this character arise from cowardice to become the man that God had called him to be. Talked a little bit last week as an introductory message on Gideon. Kind of, first of all, where, where they were physically in contrast to where they should have been. Chapter starts out in Judges chapter 6. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And that always opens the door for trouble. Anytime you choose to go against the will of God, be sure the Midianites are on their way. They are mounting their camels. Now, this was not an occupying force, as we said last week, like the, you know, they would come in like the Romans, the Babylonians, or whoever. This was a force that would come in uh, from as far away as 100 miles on camels by the thousands. And <clears throat> the Bible said like a locust, they would come in and swarm the land. Children of Israel had begun to find places to hide in the caves and the mountains for fear. Everything they had worked for would be lost in one day or so because the Midianites would come in and steal and pillage and take everything that was theirs that they'd worked hard for. We talked about how that so much reflects uh, Christianity today. There's a lot of Christians who are like the children of Israel. They have not been what God's called them to be. They're sitting down in their fear and doubt and worry. And when God does show up, it's like Gideon, a quick response. Well, if the Lord's for us, then why is all this happening to me? And where are his miracles? You know, they didn't, don't see, as Gideon didn't see, that the presence of the Lord was there. It was God's presence that brought chastening. We talked about the chastening of God is always a sign of God's love for us and his presence in our life. So chastening is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And then obviously the scripture says in that chapter that God had even sent them a prophet. It didn't tell us the name of that prophet, but God still had sent a man with the word and they rejected that. And now all this trouble comes. And here's Gideon, he's hiding out in the wine press, trying to thrash out a living, hiding so that the Midianites won't steal what he's gotten. And again, this is such a tragic illustration of so many people uh, and we ought to be able to easily relate at different times in our own life of how this man is so depictive of so many Christians who are living this you know, half-hearted, uh, fearful kind of Christian life. Uh, there's no demonstration of grace and might and power and victory, only defeat. And the resources they have are being squandered by the enemy. The fruitfulness that should be there, what little there is, is stolen by the enemy. No lasting joy, no lasting victory. But what a great picture of, of, of I've seen my own life have been times like that where just no real victory in my heart and life. So we, as you look into Gideon and we talked those first verses, we talked about how God began to deal with Gideon in the context of sending the angel and what the angel said to him. We're going to pick up there in that same story, this, in the same chapter, in chapter 6 this morning as we begin to look at part 2. I just call it taking care of business, all right? Where well, the Lord gets down and starts really dealing with Gideon as the man, where he is, what he's called to do. And today as we look at this, we're going to see several things from Gideon's life, I think, that will really help us comprehend the message. In chapter 6, verse 11, it says, uh, verse 14, and the, the angel of the Lord looked at him and said, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? And he said to him, O Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh. I'm the youngest in my father's house. Now understand the Lord has just given him a word you know, that he's going to be the deliverer, that he's going to be, you know, the one who brings the, the, the deliverance from the Midianites to him. He's called him already a valiant warm, warrior, and he's told him that he's going to destroy the Midianites by, by his, his, his life. And he still doesn't believe it. You know, he's still squandering around with doubts and fears, and, you know, making excuses. We talked about being, having that victim mentality. Who am I? You know, my family's not, a, not, the, not the biggest family in town. Why don't you pick somebody who's got some, 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 some you know, some clout in the community. And, and even if I were, if it were my family, then it certainly would not be me because I'm a, I, I am the nobody. When you look at my list of brothers and sisters, they classify me as the nobody. I'm not the guy, I got a brother, I got, you know, it's the same Moses mentality. I, I, what, you know, I can't talk, Lord, let's, let's bring, use my brother. And so get, get into this old victim thing, which it's God's fault, it's people's fault, I'm nobody, and he's still going. 
But here, catch what the Lord, he's not through talking to him. But the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you. And by the way, that's all we need. We talked about that last week. I will be with you and you shall defeat Midian as one man. So Gideon said to him, if now I have found favor in thy sight, then show me a sign that it is thou who speakest with me. And he says, he asked for it. Please do not depart from here until I come back to thee. I'm going to bring out my offering and lay it before thee. And he, and he said, I will remain until you return. So Gideon went and prepared a kid, a goat, and unleavened bread from an ep heifer flour. It's a lot of flour. He put the meat in the basket and the broth in the pot, and he brought them out to him under the oak and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, lay them on this rock, and pour out your broth. And he did so. And the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand, and he touched the meat and the unleavened bread, and fire sprang up from the rock, and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread, and the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. When Gideon saw that it was the angel of the Lord, he said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said to him, Peace to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord and named it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it's still an opera of the Abizites. So you look again, you, you see, when you look at the life of Gideon, he is obviously not your hero type. He doesn't fit the bill. Nervous, intimidated, fearful, hiding. You know, it's like so many people today. So miserable in their existence and so many Christians even who are miserable. And they, even though the very presence of God is speaking to them, they're not hearing it and they don't see who it is. The Lord says to Gideon, go in this thy might. Well, what? I mean, what did he do? He just told him he was a mighty warrior. Well, that's the word he's talking about. Take the word of God and believe the word of God. And I'm going to save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. I have I not sent to you. Gideon moans. I, well, how can you use me? How wherewith shall I say live Israel? And he said, I'll be with you. And you shall smite the Midianites as one man. Gideon gives another stammer. And you know, I'm not family, I'm nobody in the family, I haven't gotten a name. And you're, you're, if you're really for me, stay here, I'll be right back. The patience of God. Yes. The patience of the Lord. The angel says, go, and waits, and waits, and waits. Who knows how long it took? You don't cook a goat real fast. <laughs> and you don't take an epaph of flour and make little unleavened bread. You make a lot of bread. And he has a broth to go along with it. He prepares his full course meal. Probably takes him hours to do so. And the angel of the Lord waits. Oh, the patience of God with the stupidity of mankind. Now, let's not get too hard on him. How often have we done the same with God? You know, we got to take and deliberate and make up our little excuses and do our little offering and everything we go through. When God just, Go do what I told you. Just go in this time out. You have a word, or believe the word, trust me, and go do it. And so he brings the offering back and presents it, and then it goes up in vapor and smoke, and he says, oh, I'm going to die now. I've seen the angel, I'm going to die. That's pretty much what it said. I'm going to die. I love the Lord's response. You're not going to die. <laughs> You're not going to die. You know, just go do what I've told you to do. Be, I've already told you what you're going to do. You've been given the promise. I said, I'd be with you. All right. I've given you a word. You have clarity here. You're not going to die. And again, here he is like, like so many. I, I want to break this, this whole incident down into three things that really give us some, I think, some, some instruction from the word of God. And these are the three points. First of all, I want to show you there is this point of conversion that takes place. And with anybody, there's this point of conversion that's going to be used by God. And then there's this point where, where real commitment, the, the putting it all on the altar, making the difference, being used by God, and, and moving forward. The consecration. This has to be a part of our spiritual walk in life if we're going to move out of that victim mentality and move from cowardly to courageous. And then there's that third part where he's filled with the Spirit. Look at the first one, the conversion. And let me say this, and, and you need to understand this, because a lot of people, they never get into this arena uh, that we're talking about. And you say, what do you mean? This, the idea of being born again is, is still foreign. We've been preaching it for years. The evangelical church has preached for years, but people still don't get it. Jesus said it. You must be born again. Now, if you're going to have eternal life, if you're going to know me, if you're going to live for me, if you're going to walk with me, you have to be saved. Conversion has to happen in your life. Everybody in the Old Testament, 
everybody in the New Testament that was used by God had to experience at some point that crisis moment in their life of conversion. The point we say, no longer am I living for myself, I'm living for God. This is where Gideon's coming to right now. This, I mean, he's, he's having a head on meat. I, I don't know about you, but I, I think if you get real honest with God, God's probably brought you to some of these places in your life to have that head on meeting. The first meeting is important because that's where we make the decision that no longer I, but Christ. I'm not living for Joe now. I'm going to start living for Jesus. Sometimes it happens at an early young age, as a child, sometimes as a teenager, sometimes as an adult. But wherever it is, you can be sure God's going to, everything that will work in your life comes from that moment. All right? It's going to come from that moment. And I believe God's a big enough God and faithful enough God to bring each one of us to an understanding. Hey, there's a point in my life where I said I do to Jesus. Now, a lot of people, they say, well, I think I am, and I'd like to think I'm saved. And, you know, be, yeah, yeah, I go to church. Well, you don't get it by coming to church. You get it by coming to Jesus. You don't get it by osmosis. You can't say, well, my brother, my aunt, my uncle, they were all in ministry. My dad's a deacon. My grandpa's a pastor. And, you know, so I'm saved. I grew up in a Christian family. It doesn't come by natural heredity. All right? It comes through the Spirit of God. You must be born again. There has to be a point in time in your life when when you realize you're a sinner. There's a point in time in your life where you realize he's the Savior. There's a point in time you realize, realize this choice of faith must be made. A conversion has to take place. The Bible says if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. That, that happens at some specific time. You can't just say, well, I'd like to think. I, I know. I, I think God will give you clarity as to the general time it was, if not even the very specific moment that it was, if you're not quite sure. And if I had no clarity in my life about when that was, well, I think I would take care of it now. T today's the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the day of provocation. In other words, give your life to Jesus completely today. Don't think that any amount of church attendance, religiosity, any of that's going to make any difference. There's nothing you can do to make yourself right with God. It's already been done. Jesus Christ paid the price on the cross. Salvation now is available to all, but you've got to come to this place of decision. Have you been there? You see it in Gideon's life when he gets to this point. He, this, this, this is really a picture of unconverted giving, Gideon giving all these sorry excuses and uh, this great picture of, of spiritual paralysis in his life. And that always accompanies unbelief. You know, it always gets to that point. It, it, I, I can't do that. I mean, my brother Phil's here today. How many times he witnessed to me? My mindset was this. I'm not, I, I, I can't live that way. I'm not going to do that. I, I'm, I'm not going to be a, you know, a, a hypocrite. You know, I grew up in the 60s. Most hypocritical age it ever was. They just didn't know it. He was telling, oh, man, I'm not going to be plastic. Vinyl, I don't know. I'm not going to be plastic, man. And I basically, I'm, saying, I'm not going to play church. And I know at the same time, there's no way I could do that. It's like Gideon. There's no way I can do that. I'm a nope. I can't do that. That, that. I've tried that. It doesn't work for me. That really, I can't live that kind of life. This is where God has to come in. And this is the encounter that Gideon has to have, where he realizes that God has to do something in his life where he's hopeless. It's got to be God. And that's why this, this stammering goes on, I believe, and why this struggle goes on. Well, if it's really you, because how often have we done that same thing? I mean, how many times, even as, as a young person, you lay in bed at night saying, God, I want you to speak to me. God, if you're real, then turn the lights on. You know, if you're real, do something. Make my mother come in here and sing Amazing Grace. Whatever it is, you know, it's that moment of, of just ignorance. And Gideon, boy, he's certainly a great character for this. Here the angel of the Lord has completed his visit with him and now something's beginning to stir in his heart. He begins to this place now, he's starting to be convinced regarding God and this message and this word to him. In verse 24 it says this, And Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Now this is extremely significant. This is of vital significance, for not just for Gideon in this moment, but for us. There has to be an altar moment for us. This, this altar is the place where Gideon slows down and says, okay, God is here. I'm going to recognize his presence. The altar's always been a picture of that. We have altar calls at church. It's basically just a symbolic place where we're saying, hey, this is where I lay it all down. This is where I'm getting right with God. This is where I'm moving forward. It's, it's an outward symbol of an inward transaction. 
between God and man that says, you know, the human soul is having an encounter with God's spirit, and I'm going to listen to what God has to say to me. So Gideon, at this moment, builds this altar to Jehovah, basically saying, I'm no longer building altars to false gods. I'm building the altar to the true God, and I'm going to become a worshiper of the true God. It's a, this, is, this is so important, whether it was Elijah building the altar on Mount Carmel or altars throughout Scripture or the altars of the New Testament, the place where we come and we just lay it all down. It's Jesus now, not me. Has that ever happened? Has that ever taken place in your life? I think some people try to paddle around this situation. They don't want to come to this place and say, it's all or nothing. I'm really giving it all to Jesus because nobody wants to give up everything. We think there's something out there that we just have to hold on to. We think there's something there perhaps that the world's really got that is going to make us happy or that might bring us satisfaction. But it's failing constantly. It never satisfied, nor can it satisfy. Nothing satisfies but Jesus in the bottom line because God created you that way so that you would have a relationship with Him. And the answer is found in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. And you need an altar experience. Say, I come to Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I'm giving my heart and my life to Him. And this is where it comes. This is a picture of, of repentance and faith here. And then he, he gives this altar a very significant name. Jehovah Shalom. God's my peace. Now, if you look at this young Hebrew's life, this is probably the first time ever he's experienced genuine peace in his life. There's no peace in the world around him. Fear, doubt, confusion, hiding out for fear, running, cowardice on every hand. Boy, this is always, though, I believe the first byproduct of genuine conversion is, can be wrapped up in this, Jehovah Shalom. God's my peace. The apostle said God has given us peace through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Through, through, he has broken down the walls, the hindrances, the separation, has brought us peace. Over and over you see the anthem from the Gospels to the epistles of peace. Peace with God, peace from God, peace in Christ. The world doesn't give it. Only God gives this kind of peace. And here is Gideon saying, you're my peace. There's no other way. So you look very carefully. And I think at that point, you not only look carefully, you say, has this ever happened in my life? Has there ever been a transformation in me that resulted in me having peace with God? We're still living in fear and doubt. A lot of people are. Second aspect of this, we said, was Gideon's consecration. And, 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 and you watch what happens here. Gideon is obviously showing that he has yielded his will now to the Lord God because he begins to obey what the Lord says to him. In verse 25 through 27, the same night it came about that the Lord said to Gideon, take your father's bull. I've been telling my son that for a year. Take your father's bull. Anyway, <laughs> and a second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal, which belongs to your father, and cut down the Asherah that's beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God. All right? Do it in an orderly manner. Now, the, the altar of Baal, remember, this is, where, this is where it got the children of Israel in trouble every time that they began to backslide. It started with this pagan altars, pagan deities, and pagan gods. They let the, the world around them influence their attitudes, their behavior, their worship, and they constantly were mixing in, during these times of rebellion, the pagan worship along with true worship of God, at least trying to. Same thing that J James and, and John both rebuked the church for, trying to love the world and to love God. Baal is that the God of prosperity is what it really boils down to if you want to know his, why he was worshipped, which is the altar which most people in, a, in the Western Hemisphere bow down to already. I want to be blessed. I want more. I want to be rich. I want, and I think these things will make me happy. So we say, I love God, but yet we'll go do whatever it takes to get more, to seek, to prosper. This is the first thing I want you to do. I want you to tear down the altar bell, and not only that, tear down the Asherah. What was the Asherah? The Asherah was a wooden altar and a wooden, wooden image of, 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 this, of this female goddess that they also worshipped. Tear that down and build this new altar in an orderly manner. And it goes on to say, and, and take the second bull and offer a burnt offering with the wood of Asherah. In other words, whatever you, you tore that down, take that wood from that idol and burn it and put the altar, the, the sacrifice on it. And Gideon took 10 men of his servants and did as the Lord had spoken to him. And it came about because he was too afraid of his father's household and the men of the city to do it by day, he did it by night. Hey, he's growing, he's doing. Give him a, hey, don't fuss at Gideon if you hadn't torn down the altars yet. If you hadn't taken out the false gods in your life, 
all those other things that we worship about ourselves and the world we live in, if you had not dealt with those, don't, don't gripe about Gideon. At least he's doing it. He takes what he's told to take and he does it, but yet he does it by night because there's still this element of fear. But bless God, he's taking some steps. They're baby steps, but he's a baby. All right? He's moving in the right direction, which is more than I can say for a lot of people. He's seeking to do what God has told him to do. And he begins to head out and tear it down. Now, if you compare your own spiritual life, it's the same thing in your own spiritual walk. Uh, one thing, I, right after I gave my life to Jesus, God started dealing with me about the idols that were in my life. The things, and what is the idol? Anything I put before him. Those things that I, that I honor before him, the things that I keep to myself before him, the things he told me to lay aside, but yet I do them anyway. Those are the things that I have to take bold, dramatic steps to deal with and to tear them down. And Gideon's living at a time, and he knows there's some ramifications when this, this Baal worship is widespread. I mean, there's this religious apostasy. And God says, I want you to start dealing with that, but you start at home. Before you take it anywhere else, deal with it at the house. And this has to be true, doesn't it? We have to take it home first. We have to take it to our own life. We have to deal with our own issues. We have to let God speak to our lives and deal with our idols. Oh, boy, we as Christians, we love to point out everybody's failures and refuse to look at our own. Amen? Because, you know, somehow in looking at others' failures, then somehow we feel justified in our failures. But you can't use the justification cycle anymore. You can't get caught up in that blame somebody syndrome. You have to say, hey, this altar's in my front yard. It's in my house. It's coming down. It's coming down. And he makes the steps and he moves forward to destroy that altar. Why was it even there? It was there because he had allowed it to be built there. He and his father and their family had allowed this built, or the altar to be built there. I think a lot of it had to go back. If you study the, 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 what was going on in the nation, as well as there were true prophets of God, there were a lot of false prophets. And the false prophets were sending a very mixed message that you could have these things in your life that God opposed as long as you had God in your life. You know? As long as you honor the Lord. Boy, a great demonstration. This is, I think, what is it, the Grammys tonight or the, which one, Oscars? One of them's on tonight. You'll see this whole thing very clearly played out in the modern world. Someone will come to stage to receive an honor that their friends gave them. <laughs> And they'll hold their little statue up. I just want to thank God. Now, what they did, they just made the filthiest movie with about every curse word you can imagine. Running around committing adultery, homosexual action, all, all kinds of ungodliness and worldliness taking place in the movie. And yet, I, I, I just need to give God all the glory. Excuse me. Hello. Where did you think you could do that? Well, it goes back to a little... Pablum preachers, and false prophets of the culture in our world today that tell these people, oh, you're an artist. So that as an artist, it's completely different. No, it's not different. Your art should glorify God. Not the flesh, not the world, not sin, not the devil. It should honor the Lord God. You honor God. But yet that's, that's where we are today, isn't it? We just live ungodly lives, live how we want to live, and it's just all played out before us in cinematic color screens. And a lot of it gets down, the same problem with Israel, they had these, excuse the word, might not be appropriate for you in that context, but it was modernist of the day. Modernist and liberal philosophers and preachers and pastors and teachers who wouldn't stand and preach the truth. Gideon moves forward, and he tears down the altar. Now, there's two responses that are given. The first is the obvious negative response. And by the way, there's never going to be a good response when you start tearing down the false gods in your life. You know, and especially from your friends and neighbors. And sometimes from your family. Amen? It's a negative response. And they say, who did this thing? Who did this? Now, isn't it amazing? Here are the people who are supposed to be serving the one and the only true God. The God of Israel. The God of Jacob. The God of, I, the God of Abraham. And now they're trying to defend this idol. Who did this terrible thing? And they're ready to kill whoever did it. But be sure that there will never be a peaceful coexistence with the devil with the world, with idolatry. It's just not going to happen. Anytime you choose to make a big decision, hey, try this around your family first, amen, like Gideon did. I'm going to live for Jesus. Oh, there he goes again. Fanatics, crazy people. 
Hey, I'd rather be crazy for him. Is that what the apostle said? Call me mad. I'm a madman, but I'm mad for Jesus. Who are you mad for? Who are you out of your mind for? I'm out of my mind for the love of Christ. I love God. And here it is. It's, it's, it's just rejection because we just, you know, it, it runs counter to, to, to the popular will. It's an invitation for crisis and for problems. When you stand and say, I'm going to live for Christ. I'm going to live for the Lord. I'm going to be what God's called me to be. And they say, whoever's guilty about this, we're going to kill him. Now, you've got to realize at the same time, when there's this negative thing on, there's also a very positive response that takes place, and especially from his own father. Here's Joash. You think for a moment, Joash walks out, I just spent a lot of money on this idol. Who tore this down? My son, I'm going to kill that kid. Now, there's something that sparked in his heart when he sees the conviction of his young man, his son, who's given his heart and life to get right with God. And I believe there's a lot of people like that standing on the sidelines who at one time served God, were on fire for God, and were used by God, who are just waiting for somebody else to spark a fire, to lead the way, to stand and, and to rally the, the charge against the enemy. There's just, I don't know about you. When I get around people who are wholly consecrated and committed, it sparks a fire in me, does it not you? When there's just something here, a testimony of the grace of God or the glory of God in somebody's life. We say, I, want, I want to be a part of that. You know, a lot of the missions and ministries that we support in our, in our church are, are start with that because there's someone we see and someone we know and we witness what God's doing in their life and say, hey, I want to be a part of that. That's a, that's a step of faith. That's a, that's a declaration for the glory of God. Be, and this is exactly where Joe Ash is. In fact, he starts telling, hey, if anybody wants to argue about it, you can be dead before tomorrow. I like that response. Here's what he said. Joyce said to them, will you contend for Baal? You're going to deliver Baal? Whoever will plead for him shall be put to death by morning. Kind of solved the question right there, didn't it? If he is God, let him contend for himself because someone tore down his altar. Therefore, on that day, he named Gideon Jeroboam. That is to say, let Baal contend against him because he's torn down his altar. So you see a great picture of his father's repentance, but at the same time, his father's understanding that this world and Baal and the gods of this world and the mindset and the philosophy of this world does not bring any life. It's not worth contending for. I love it. It's like Elijah up on Mount Carmel, remember? When he says, you, you build your altar to Baal, I'll build one to God, and we'll see who's got answers by fire, and that's who we'll serve. We'll serve the real God. He said, Baal's so ticked off about this, let him contend for himself. In fact, the Hebrew context of this word is, let him send an advocate. Let, him send, let me put it in more common vernacular today. Sue me. Let Baal sue me. He's not going to sue me. Why? Because he's not real. There's no substance to him. In fact, I'm changing my son's name to Jeroboam, contender with Baal. Listen, we all ought to desire to be named that. And there is something about our lives that when God places his, his, his grace upon us, there is this new name. It's the name of Jesus now. And because we're named Jesus, we are a contender with Baal. We are going to be God's representative of salt and light. Wherever Gideon was, that was a bad, bad picture and a bad testimony for Baal. The Baal's so big, why didn't he kill Gideon? It's wherever he was. It was a testimony of grace and the glory of God. And so he wrecks this altar and he builds the new altar just as he's told to do. Now this is what we call consecration. He's willing to go all the way to whatever the will of God is in his life. And as he does that, yes, there's negatives, but yes, there's positives. There's a, there, God's getting ready to do something in the whole country, which leads you to the third point of the story is how Gideon becomes controlled by the Spirit of God. In verse 34, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet, and Abiezer was gathered after him. He's the leader. Well, who died and made him leader? Jesus. But he also rose again. <laughs> who died and gave you authority? Jesus. Amen. Jesus, he rose from the dead, and he crowns you with victory. He crowns you with courage. He crowns you with authority. You're a new creation. And the way you discover that is by going out and tearing down the altars. And as you do that, you discover the grace of God. But you also realize at this point, when I step out to obey God, here comes God stepping out to do something special in my life that's needed for me to be able to do what God wants me to do. That is, He fills me with His Spirit. He fills me with His Spirit. I, I love the, a, another more common translation that says, it says this, the Spirit of Jehovah clothed Himself with Gideon. A lot of times we talk about dying to ourselves and dying, you know, you've got to come to the end of yourself. And those but you, I don't think we understand the full picture here. 
It doesn't mean that Joe Arms, when I die to myself, I cease to exist. No, what I'm dying to is my sin nature. Believe it or not, God loves Joe Arms very much, <laughs> a lot. And God has a plan for Joe Arms' life as much as he has a plan for your life. God's not trying to de demolish or destroy you as the person he made you to be. Your personality is unique. Your life is unique. You're unique in the very kingdom of God. And God has you in his kingdom uniquely for a purpose that matches and fits what he's made you to be already. Now, all those elements of my personality, the sin nature, that's what I lay down to, 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 in, the, in the grave and die to daily. But at this point, the Holy Spirit is supposed to occupy this, this, this vessel and this temple, but not just to occupy, and I believe that happens at salvation. Now, there's a contending argument, but the Bible says in Romans 8, if you have not the Spirit of Christ, you're none of His. And by the way, there's not a Spirit of Christ and a Holy Spirit. One Lord, one Spirit. Still with me? But it's one thing to have the occupation of the Holy Spirit in my life it's another thing to allow that spirit who occupies me control me. And this is where Gideon's moved to, just from that commitment now, the Holy Spirit comes to control his life. And it's not like, as we said, getting rid of you and you now become a Jesus robot and God's pushing remote control buttons to get you to do what he wants to do. That's not what it means at all. In fact, the Bible brings it very simply down to, to a simple formula of just, I allow, I let the Holy Spirit control me. The Bible says, do not be drunk with wine, that's excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, all right? And the context and the concept of filling and being drunk are one and the same here. How do you get drunk? Please don't stand up and tell me, we all know. You drink, all right? And the more you drink, the drunker you get, all right? What's happened here? You, by your own volition, chose to pick up a bottle or can or whatever and start drinking. All right, you gave control. You willfully said, well, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. You did it. All right? He might have tempted you, but you helped him. All right? You volitionally, willfully decided to drink. And what happened? It's excess. Wreck your life. Anybody ever here been drunk? Oh, don't raise your hand. Just, I'll just, I, I kind of got an idea. I want you to nod or something. How many of you ever made the best choices of your life while you were drunk? The wisest, most sensible, rational decisions of your life were made while I was drunk. That's why you're in jail. <laughs> That's why you've been married 42 times. That's why your life's miserable today. No, they weren't. The stupidest things you've ever done have been when you've been stone drunk or inebriated or wasted on something. But on the other hand, you did that. You, you did that. Say that. I did that. You willfully did that. But the same hand, on the same way, I allowed the Holy Spirit, I let the Holy Spirit fill me, control me. I drink him in. I take him. I pour his life. How do I do it? I'm in his word. I'm seeking his face. I'm praising him. I'm worshiping him. I'm embracing him today. And what's happening? The Holy Spirit's just energizing my life, controlling, giving me the strength to do what I could not do. Giving me the power to stand where I didn't think I could stand. Giving me the ability to speak where I didn't think I'd have words even. You see this all through the New Testament, especially where he talks about all those significant signs of, 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 of what God does when somebody's filled with the Holy Spirit. Every case, when you read the New Testament, every case where people were filled with the Spirit, it says, and they were filled with the Spirit, and they spoke the Word of God with boldness. Every time. Can't get around it. Well, I don't speak the Word with God with boldness. Maybe you're not filled with the Spirit. Maybe you're excited about religion. Maybe you're trying to make an impact upon friends and family, but you're not filled with the Spirit. So how, do, how do you know that, that he's filled with the Spirit? There's this significant moment when he realizes that he's, he's, he's been called of God, God's hand, and his, his life is yielded. When he takes up the shofar horn, that ram's horn, and he sounds it to call the tribe together, to tell them a new day has started. We are now declaring war on the enemy. And we're also declaring peace and victory for the people of God. A declaration. That's usually the greatest evidence of anybody ever being filled with the Spirit. There is a trumpet that sounds in their life. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in each one of us when we choose to stand up and say, hey, 
My life counts for God. I believe God. I'm moving forward for God. I want to make a difference in the world around me. But you know, there's so much preaching today that's so just so inward it never gets outward. It's all about me, what God can do in my life, how God can answer my prayers, how can I be a better husband, how can I be a better wife, how can I be a better parent, how can I do that? I'll tell you how, get filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians talks about the family and the husbands loving your wife and wives submitting your husbands and children honoring you, but it doesn't even get to that. So it says be filled with the Spirit first. Be filled with the Spirit. Then that follows in the context. All right? Be filled with the Spirit. And then all these other things. You know what we need to do? I say, get your head up out of this little internal world you're living in. Look out beyond you. The fields are widened to harvest. There are people all around us where you will be today, where you will be tomorrow, and all of this week, who if they die in that day, they will die without God into a Christless eternity. And we're there to lift up the trumpet. Hey, there's peace and there's freedom and there's victory and there's grace in Jesus Christ. It's the gospel message. Paul said, that's why I'm alive. That's why I live. He said, this is one thing, that I might win. That's what he said. Not with himself, win a race, no, that I might win some. Even when you talk about where Paul's saying, I buffet my body, I run the race, all those things that he's talking about in the context of living for Christ, he says, I'm doing all that to win some. It's all about winning people to Jesus. It's all about making a difference. It's all about bringing people to Christ. It's all about people coming to know what it really means to know Jesus as the Lord and Savior. Boy, how, that sound of that trumpet must have sounded, and that's a nasty sounding horn, by the way. If you've ever heard the show for it. Sound like a dying goat. <laughs> On an amplifier. That is the sweetest sound. I think I've shared with you, one of the greatest cassette tapes I listened to was in Israel one time. We were there in Jerusalem, and Susan Marcus, our guide, had a cassette tape that was taped down when after the Six Day War where, the, where they took the wall in, in Jerusalem where they took the holy sites and the, these rabbis were down there, gunfire, bam, 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 all around. And you hear this shofar in the background. <laughs> Recaptured the city of Jerusalem. That's, that was a sound, sweet victory in the midst of the gunfire. It still rings today in the midst of our spiritual battles. But we need to listen again to that clarion call from the Spirit of God to rise up. And that happens as we begin now to allow the Holy Spirit. When I get up in the morning, I'm going to let the Holy Spirit rule and reign in this mortal body. And He will clothe Himself with me. Isn't that beautiful? I'm clothed with Him. He's clothed. That's what Jesus said. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. But not only is your life hid with Christ in God, I'm surrounded. His life is hid with me. And I am veiling in this temple, this holy place, is the body, the temple of the Lord, for the glory of God to be used by God. You know, don't get fooled by the devil. Always focusing on yourself, your needs, your situation, your problems. Get on fire for Jesus. Get back in love with Jesus. Get back to the point where saying, I'm going to allow you Holy Spirit. I just don't know how to do that, Brother Joe. It's a very simple word. Let that. Let the peace of God, let this mind be in you. you know, let the Holy Spirit rule in your let grace of God rule in your mortal body. It's just over again. Over. Let, 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 let. In other words, it's something God's ready to do. And we're sitting around trying to come up with a formula. And the Bible says, be not removed from the simplicity which is in Christ Jesus. It's time to let, start letting God be God in our lives. It's time to tear down the altars. Time to destroy the things that are hindering our families and our lives and say, I want to be what God's called me to be. And this is exactly where getting is. Am I going to be a man of faith and believe this message I've heard from God? Am I not? He takes a step and believes, and transformation comes. He then begins to move towards the will of God in his life. Now that he's following Jesus and following God's will, he tears down the altars. That's the second step. You've got to get rid of the junk. Third step is blow the horn. Sound the declaration. It's a declaration. Defeat to the enemy, victory for Christ. Step out and be what God calls you to be. It's a matter of you letting God be God. In a moment, when the service is over, you're going to go out and you're going to get in your car and go home or eat or wherever you're going to go. You have one simple requirement. 
to get where you're going. Get in the car, turn it on. Put it in gear. Pretty simple. Isn't it? You're not going to get to your house if you don't do that. You can sit in your car and pray all day long. Lord, I really want to be home. God, I know it's your will for me to be home. God, help me get home. D is not for dummy, it's for drive. <laughs> Let it happen. Get in the car. Believe God. Trust the Lord. Let me close with this little anonymous poem. I don't always close with poems. The old school preachers, there's three points in a poem, but this is good. Doubt sees the obstacles. Faith sees the way. Doubt sees dark, dark night. Faith sees the day. Doubt dreads to take a step. Faith soars on high. Doubt whispers, who believes? Faith answers, I. You believe today? I believe. And this is exactly where Gideon comes to before any great exploits of conversion, consecration, and controlled by the Holy Spirit in our life. Where are you in that process? Move forward. Keep moving forward. Would you stand with your heads bowed?